Hello everybody and welcome back to the Costing and Pricing Learning Program. My name is David Gilchrist and this is webinar 11 in our webinar series, NDIS and Frontline Staff. Before I get into the substance of the webinar, as usual, I'd just like to remind everyone of the copyright arrangements, uh, remembering that we're able to use these um, materials uh, for any purpose, commercial or otherwise, but of course we must adhere here to the copyright arrangements. Please make yourself uh, familiar with those should you wish to use the materials. I'd also like to of course remind you of the navigation arrangements. Uh, this uh, webinar, webinar 11, is NDIS and frontline staff. The previous webinar 10 was ratio analysis as a control tool and webinar 12 will look at costing and pricing for volunteer directors. This webinar though is very much focused on the um, frontline carers and care supervisors within disability service organisations. The webinar is designed to give a brief overview of the NDIS, some general thoughts in relation to how uh, people who provide services might be impacted under the NDIS uh, type funding regime and also to give uh, them some ideas about how they might assist their organisations in terms of the challenges that, that the organisations face within the NDIS. Uh, funding framework. Let's get into it. What is the NDIS really? I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that, but essentially from a disability service organisation's perspective, the NDIS is really a funding model. It's a funding model that focus on, focuses on individuals and individualised funding. Having said that, the NDIS is a model that is quite um, substantial in the context of the disability services sector going forward, but equally is a funding model that is used by most jurisdictions around Australia. Most governments provide funding for human services under an individualised funding uh, model, and as such, the NDIS is not uh, unique in that sense, but of course it is the most substantial change that we've seen in disability services funding for a long time. Therefore, this model is intended to address the needs of the individual as the focus of funding. There are a, very, a number of very important financial changes though that the NDIS introduces, and those financial and operational changes will impact both frontline staff as well as the strategy of organisations. Often though, frontline staff perhaps don't get uh, the right communications in terms of what the NDIS is about and why some of the strategies are being adopted uh, within an organisation. To some degree, I want to give some context to the NDIS so that frontline front staff might be able to understand better those strategies. Of course, there will also be an impact from the NDIS on services uh, to users, and so users will be affected by this kind of model as well. Let's have a look at some of those impacts. Firstly, the financial impact. In historical terms, most uh, jurisdictions have in some way, shape or form provided funding in advance to organisations that provide disability services and often even at a block funding level. In other words, not necessarily funding provided to individuals or based on individuals and not necessarily provided um, in arrears. And this is a big problem or a big issue for organisations to face going forward and that is under the NDIS arrangements, you will be paid for services that are actually delivered after those services have been delivered. This means that there's a significant financial impact because organisations have to have money available to be able to pay their bills while they're waiting for NDIS to pay uh, for invoices for services delivered. But it also has a significant impact on service delivery because you only get paid for what you do. And I think that's a really important issue for all staff within disability services organisations to recognise. It's important to get the services uh, undertaken so that payment can be um, uh, arranged. There is limited provision for taking on clients, that is funding for taking on clients. Um, vacancy rates or subsidies assisting with viability though are no longer um, necessarily supported and there is minimal support for managing inquiries and for no-shows or inability to deliver a service. In other words, where you have people inquiring about your services, 
uh, people who might be asking questions or might need to be channeled to other services uh, or are all costs associated with running your organisation that are not funded necessarily through the NDIS funding framework. Again, if you are unable to deliver a service for some reason, including that the recipient, the service user is unavailable or um, doesn't want to receive a service, then you're unable to charge for that service. So I think most people can see straight away that there are potential financial risks faced by a disability service organisation under the NDIS because of that need to ensure that you actually achieve all of your service delivery activity that you need to so that you can recover the costs associated with uh, operating your organisation. In other words, under the NDIS, quite a significant amount of financial risk has been transferred from the government to disability service providers. What about from an operational uh, perspective? As I indicated a little earlier, there are also some operational impacts associated with the NDIS. These include that there will be a lot more focus on activity levels and timing of activity levels. Because, as I mentioned before, you only get paid once you deliver a service, it will become increasingly important for disability service organisations to make sure they get the number of services, uh, if you like, out the door uh, that they intended to get within the time frame that is necessary to recover their costs. There will also be more focus on the services that are actually funded. Because it is an individualised funding system and because the NDIS offers a price list for particular services, there will be a great difficulty for funding to be achieved for items that you might provide to your clients that are not actually part of their plan or part of the price list that the NDIS provides. Therefore, organisations necessarily must focus on services that are actually funded. Therefore, there will also be more concern regarding additional unfunded services that you might traditionally provide or have been able to provide in, if you like, looser funding arrangements that we've had historically. That concern would take two elements. Firstly, you would be concerned about uh, whether or not you're providing the services that are actually funded uh, and not spending uh, as much time providing those additional services. And secondly, ensuring that you are still mission focused and providing a holistic service for your clients. That mission centricity or mission focus is really important and I'll come back to that. However, there is a concern um, under the end NDIS arrangement that some organisations might go to extremes in relation to uh, making sure that they only provide funded services. All organisations need to make decisions about this particular issue themselves and they need to consider their financial sustainability in the short, medium and longer term uh, in making those decisions. What is important to understand is, of course, that there will be increasing focus from the carers and supervisors' perspective on those unfunded activities to make sure that those unfunded activities don't jeopardise the broader organisation into the future. There will also be more focus on continuous activity output reporting. What we mean by that is that it's always been traditional within the disability services sector for us to look at uh, the actual costs versus our budgeted costs, but we rarely, if ever, have looked at the activity in a um, deep way and we need to understand that the activity must be undertaken within the time frames that we plan for in order to recover our costs and therefore that's going to be an increasing focus on that continuous activity reporting to make sure that the number of activities expected are actually delivered in terms of the funded activities particularly. Of course, there is also likely to be some service user impacts as a result of the NDIS. The service plan itself, for instance, is developed by the NDIS and provided to the consumer, as I'm sure many carers and supervisors would be aware. However, there is no, uh, at this stage, uh, prospect for service providers to be involved in that process and sometimes consumers don't actually understand what it is that they might be uh, requiring 
and more fully may not actually appreciate how the system works and therefore it's going to be very important from a service user perspective to ensure that you're able to coach those prospective users uh, so that they understand how the system works and to be able to appreciate that they might have expectations that are different to the reality of the NDIS. You might have um, those expectations, particularly where you have very new people entering into disability service needs as a result of uh, acquired brain injury or some other reason uh, that sees them newly entered into the system after they have listened to the political rhetoric and national conversation around the NDIS. They may well have expectations beyond what can be provided. And finally, of course, advocacy can be impacted by the NDIS. That is, that advocacy that many of our disability service organisations provide in supporting their clients to ensure they get the proper services at the proper time and they're adequately resourced for their needs. The NDIS is a very transactional focus and one of the chief issues uh, from the point of view of carers and supervisors is that they need to maintain that relationship particularly with those um, service users that have a long term relationship with your organisation. The transactional focus really means that the NDIS is interested in each service and making sure that that service is provided and then paid for. Of course, from a disability service organisation perspective, often you have a long-term relationship with clients and you look after their, all of their needs or at least have a holistic view of their life, not just their service needs as well. So I think that's an important aspect as well that service user impacts uh, might include that um, they find a disjointed service as a result of the way the services are funded within organisations. The final point that I want to raise in terms of the response to the NDIS or the potential impacts includes some of the things that are relevant to disability service organisations. Carers and care supervisors, people who provide that frontline service for their organisation are often not necessarily fully aware of some of the things that organisations have to do to be able to respond to the NDIS. Ultimately, the NDIS and individualised funding, person-centred care, is a very positive uh, opportunity for disability service organisations. It allows those organisations to really focus on what is needed by individuals, but more important, at the corporate level, if you like, it gives the organisations a much better understanding of their financial sustainability in the short, medium and longer term. So how are DSOs corporations are responding to the NDIS, well first and foremost they're undertaking what we call a costing and pricing exercise and this is a continuous exercise where they look at exactly how much it costs to deliver each service and what the price needs to be for that service in order for them to be um, sustainable in the short, medium and longer term. They're also becoming increasingly financially vigilant, that is Organisations, disability service organisations are ensuring that they're getting better financial information all the time and focusing on those activities which are financially important for their organisation but also making sure that they understand the mission centred activities that don't necessarily result in a financial outcome. This might have um, an impact on carers and care supervisors, frontline staff, because they're seeing that senior managers are looking more and more at the mix of services and the emphasis on those services that are actually returning a financial return to the organisation. Senior staff are making decisions about what services to provide, when to provide them and whether to continue to provide underfunded or unfunded mission focused activities. And this is not to say that the NDIS doesn't want those activities nor that organisations should automatically stop those activities just because they're not funded. But what is important is that DSOs spend time understanding the real financial impact of those underfunded or unfunded mission focused activities to ensure that their organisation continues to be sustainable. From your perspective as a carer or a supervisor of carers, it's important to understand that there does need to be a very close focus on unfunded activities or underfunded activities to make sure the organisation continues to be sustainable. 
Does that mean, though, that the mission is not important? As I said before, it doesn't. It certainly doesn't. So one of the key things that sets aside disability service organisations from other organisations in our broader economy is, of course, their focus on clients. And that focus on clients has been a, historical, a historically important aspect of our mission uh, within the disability services sector. The approach, though, might be a little bit different in the sense that we seek to understand our mission-centric activities from the point of view of knowledge of their financial impact much more. In other words, we have to build real knowledge understanding those services and particularly the costs of those services so that we can make decisions about how much of a mission-focused, underfunded or unfunded service we should provide to clients. There's always a line in the sand where we cannot continue to provide underfunded or unfunded services because it will affect the financial sustainability of the organisation, which of course ultimately means that all services would be affected. So there's got to be a balance between the provision of those services that are actually funded under the NDIS scheme and those peripheral services or additional services that make up the holistic service delivery experience for your clients, but which do uh, represent a financial threat for the organisation. What can carers do to assist? One of the things about the NDIS is that up until relatively recently, it has been an issue for CFOs and CEOs in organisations. So those senior people that are making decisions about the finances and decisions about the, the strategy. Board members are also being very interested in the NDIS and have as have senior operational managers. But carers and other frontline staff always also have great opportunities for assisting their organisation in achieving the mission that has been set. And this is really important in the context of my comments around the NDIS actually ultimately being a very positive opportunity for organisations involved in disability service provision. One of the things that carers can do uh, very well and are very well placed to do is to provide feedback to supervisors and managers about how clients are feeling in relation to the NDIS and this might include how clients are brought on into the organisation, what their experiences are and the kinds of things that might make them feel more or less satisfied with the service that your organisation is, uh, is providing. So what the clients are thinking about it is a really important issue that really only carers and, their, uh, and other frontline staff have an opportunity to feel and um, experience firsthand. The second element that should be considered in that context includes how services should be packaged. So some of the efficiencies or opportunities for doing things better are only known by those people who actually undertake that, the tasks and it is incumbent on carers and fr other frontline staff to form those opinions and to feed them back up the line to be able to respond to new service users who may have a different understanding of the NDIS as a result of the community discussion uh, and to be able to communicate more fully up the ranks of the organisation to make sure that some of those things that only you can see as a carer are actually taken into consideration by those people who have a more corporate view, a wider view of what's going on in the organisation. Further to that, frontline staff can also identify opportunities for cost savings and essentially it's important to look at and understand where costs are obviously poorly managed. So where situations that you can see in your day-to-day -day work where it could be cheaper, easier, more efficient for your organisation to provide services or indeed reporting on opportunities for rostering or other changes that are likely to introduce savings in the context of service quality. Remembering NDIS is focused on the uh, funding side of things but of course service quality is very critical. The final point in that regard is of course that frontline staff are in a very unique position in being able to identify ways that there can be day-to-day -day savings for the organisation in the way business is undertaken, in the order of the way you provide services and making sure that at the end of the day the services are high quality but efficiently delivered uh, in the interests of the broader organisation. You can look for areas where activities of staff and volunteers are duplicated. So in other words, where things are not done in a, an efficient way or where 
some staff might do things that volunteers also do or vice versa. You can report on opportunities for reducing time in non-care activities and achieving a better, more focused, client-centric service delivery. Some of those non-care activities might include um, cleaning and other aspects of uh, what goes on within your organisation, but it also could include the administrative process and how administrative information is passed up the, uh, into the uh, corporation for decision making. I guess it's really important to remember though as a carer and someone who uh, obviously has a very close affinity with the service recipients, the people who use the services of a disability service organisation and who by and large all work for the mission of an organisation that when managers and the board talk about financial issues for your organisation you need to take them very seriously. That's not to worry about them but it is to think about how you can contribute to the financial sustainability of your organisation. The new arrangements are likely to be very impactful. If all staff in an organisation do not embrace the change and look for opportunities for efficiencies and effectiveness, the organisation will be at risk. Not only that, the organisation, if it's not efficient and effective, will be less able to provide or continue to provide those mission-centric services that are underfunded or unfunded into the future. In other words, the more efficient and more effective your organisation can be, the more opportunity there is for undertaking those mission-centric, purpose-driven aspects of the reason that you're working in the organisation that you work for. That concludes the webinar for today looking at NDIS and carers and supervisors, so frontline staff. The next webinar is costing and pricing for directors, it's webinar 12. In the meantime, the Curtin Not-for-Profit Initiative contacts are provided on this screen. Do not hesitate to give us a call, send us an email uh, in order to ask questions, make comments or indeed suggest any other material that we might be able to add to the costing and pricing learning program. All the best and I look forward to talking to you soon.